Good morning, hello, good morning. Oh, I'm a bit late. It's a good start. I'll talk to you in a second. Let me just get on the road. Woo, here we go. What is that? Bloody old plastic bag. Someone's chucked out the window. You wouldn't believe the amount of crap that people chuck out the window of their cars. How are you? I hope you're well. Oh, went flying yesterday. Good fun. I had a problem with my plane. It's only a little plane. It's only a little plane. Before you start getting, you know, all right, oh yeah, you own a plane. Okay, I bet you own stuff that's worth more than my plane. Right, my plane cost me about a thousand pounds when I bought it because the bloke who didn't want it. Well, it's, uh, it's difficult to value a plane, isn't it? How much is a plane worth? Is it worth what it's worth or is it worth what you bought it for? I'm not going to argue that. Anyway. I had a problem because uh, the fuel gauges don't work. It's a heap of junk, basically. <laughs> it, it is. It's a heap of junk. It's about 50 years old. But the great thing about planes is they're made out of aluminium and they're covered in uh, this uh, very high quality paint coating and, you know, which gets replaced every once in a while. And so uh, they get very little in the way of corrosion. Might get a bit of metal fatigue in the nose leg or stuff like that, but no, nah, it's good fun. But as I say, you know, I mean, you're, you're, there are plenty of the people are driving cars around, or have got cars in the garage which are, you know, worth four or five times what my plane's worth. Uh, the bloke next door to me, I went up to see him. I haven't seen him since his wife died, and uh, you know, he's a friendly bloke successful company been running many years and uh, he said to me oh look come and I'll show you what I bought myself so I opened the garage door and inside there's a bloody Ferrari yeah Ferrari I mean a cheap Ferrari is about 125 grand isn't it right that's probably five times what my planes were six times nearly seven times what my planes were so that's only because the demand for Ferraris is higher than the demand for light aircraft and that's only because the pool of people who can who are interested in and can afford to indulge and have got the cojones to fly a plane is much smaller than the sort of people who are in the market for just parking a Ferrari in their garage and not driving it anywhere and saying look at my Ferrari so Anyway, we had a trouble with the fuel system because the fuel gauges don't work and they can't be fixed. So, uh, I have to um, uh, measure the fuel with a, what's it called, a manometer, manometer. I'll put a pipe on the bottom of the fuel tank and then see how high the uh, fuel comes up the side of the pipe. Using atmospheric pressure. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so and one of the fuel uh, drains got blocked, and so I couldn't measure the the fuel in that tank. So I had to go down and fix that yesterday, which was uh, fixed with a, a vigorous application of something sharp and pointy up the fuel cock. <laughs> so and then things started flowing. So, uh, it reminds me of a joke I just read about a mop and bucket on aisle four. So anyway, but I won't tell you that. I won't tell you that. You can look it up. Yeah, so as you can see, the weather's nice today. We've actually got some proper clouds, not aircraft-induced clouds. Let's yeah, get rid of these bits because I know from experience that they uh, reflect in a windscreen on the uh, 
CCTV image, which is not annoying, isn't it? Anyway, look, I've been blethering on for long enough, haven't I? So I'm going to put fast forward to five minutes if you don't want a load of blether. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about saying no because I'm hopeless at saying no. I honestly, I'm hopeless. Look at the size of me. You can see I never say no to anything. So, when do you say no? Or when should you say no? So, and I'm gonna give you the, uh, my experience of an appointment I've got this morning at half past 10, which is my emergency slot. And it's really, the computer's set up not to uh, book it until the actual day. So it's for people who've got emergencies on the day. So that we, you know, we have a cup of tea if it doesn't get filled up, but if it does get filled up, then we, um, we've got time to see people who need urgent work. So you can book it up in advance, but you have to reallocate the time. So you have to reallocate it from emergency time to ordinary clinical time, and then you can book it up. So. There is a workaround, you know, for booking it in advance if you want to or need to. So, <clears throat> first person who rings up as a candidate for this time is a bloke who rings up, I think, two, three days ago. And he said, oh, I've uh, been told by my dentist I need a root filling, but uh, I just want it building up. Can you just build it up for me, this tooth? So I said, well, you know, to be honest with you, dentists do a lot of things wrong but usually when they tell you you need a root treatment you do need a root treatment I mean that's based on the fact that most dentists don't actually want to do root treatments so by the time you get someone say that you do need a root treatment then they're doing it against their better judgment and so it's probably correct <laughs> it's coming to something isn't it when a dentist Better judgment is, is what is the incorrect course of action. <laughs> so, anyway, patients don't like that. When you argue with them, if you if you say if they ring up and say you know, supposing they would need a shed bill and they want they don't like the cost of the shed that has been proposed, uh, and they ring up and they say look, can you build me a smaller shed? And they don't expect the supplier to say to them, well, actually, I agree with the original bloke. I think. I think you should have the larger shed. Are you sure <laughs> that this, you're doing a wise thing here? They don't want you to back up the person that they, whose opinion they've already discarded. So you get off on the wrong foot straight away as soon as you, you say that. What they want you to say is, yeah, come in and I'll build it up, no problem. But well, I think, again, it, it goes to a fundamental misunderstanding about how uh, dentists operate. And it's the same with... Uh, I found it out with interior designers. Uh, not an interior designer, yeah, was it? Yeah, it was an interior designer. And because I uh, tried to set up a franchise, a dental franchise about 30 years ago probably. And uh, part of it was redesigning surgeries for dentists and we would handle the design. And uh, I said to this guy who was a consultant who was working with me from BDO Stoy Hayward at the time. I said to him, what's, um, are you drunk? Mr. EJ70, like hotel whiskey, a Yankee rather. You seem a bit wobbly. Plus you've got a big dent in the side of your door. And you're driving at 30 in a 50 mile an hour zone. Yeah, so anyway, uh, I, I said to him like, you know, uh, he recommended interior designer and I, I uh, I said to him, you know, what sort of, uh, we, we, so what I did was I wanted to design it and then I wanted her to, or at least have some input into the design, let's put it that way. And he said, no, no, you won't get any input into the design. And I, and I said, why should I hire someone to do a job for me, and especially like an aesthetic subjective job, and have no input into the, into the process? And he said, well, that's what you do. You get what you do is you tend to look at their previous work and decide that you like it and there and say to them, I want you to do something for me. But you don't say to them, but it's got to be red or it's got to be in the cubist style or something. He said, you just pay, you just, 
your job is just to pay the money, and then they they, they do the you know where was where was what. So so I said right, well okay, well we can stuff that for a game of soldiers. I'm not going to just pay for something and then might end up with you know she's not changing rooms, okay. So uh, the thing this bloke hadn't realised is that when you go and see a dentist you get the examination, the diagnosis and the treatment plan it comes included and it, it comes at the front it's the front, it's front loaded <laughs> so uh, it's not like a painter where you can say I want my living room painted and uh, I want it magnolia um, it's more like uh, you know saying to a painter I want you to have a quick look at my house and see if it needs painting and if it needs painting uh, let me know which rooms need painting and what colour uh, and a lot of patients can't grok that you know they can't get their head around that so um, he was like well how much does it cost to come in oh 78 quid including the x-rays okay uh, and when can you do it? So I thought, well, the only time I can possibly do it is um, today. So I reallocated the time and I said, look, I'll pencil you in. Send you a link and uh, and uh, when we get your details back, I'll confirm it by email. Well, we never heard a word, right? And... You know, I can fair, fair enough. I can appreciate that he's sort of thought, well, I don't, I'm not really getting on brilliantly with this dentist. You know, he's he's obviously not. Uh, what he was trying to do he was trying to micromanage his treatment, and I don't usually get on very well with patients who do try and micromanage their treatment. So, um, you know, possibly he's uh, he's decided that he's not going to bother. Uh, but uh, but that's that's fair enough. So anyway, the next person who rings is another bloke who's uh, got toothache. And well, no, and also the first bloke said to me, as soon as I said to him, oh, I can do you, I can see you Thursday. He's like, well, can you uh, can you do the treatment? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. You just told me that a dentist has told you you need a root treatment. You said you don't want it root treated, you just want it filled because you're not in any pain. I haven't even seen the tooth, let alone an x-ray or a dentist notes or anything. How the hell do I know whether I can do the treatment or not? And at that point, I probably should have turned around and said, look, I don't think I can help you. I don't think I can help you. Sorry, goodbye. But anyway, I sent him a link and he, and he didn't reply. So that was that's him. Next bloke rings up. Can you see me? I'm in, I've got a toothache. Feeling fallen out, usual, same thing, whatever, whatever. Yeah, we can, we don't think this other bloke's coming in. He hasn't clicked on his link. So we say, yeah, you can come in this morning, Thursday morning, half past 10. So he's like, okay, I'll have to bring you back because I don't know if I can uh, get in at that time, you know? whether I can get the day off work basically I don't know I have to have work with my boss to see if I can take the time off and you're okay fine and you'll get this a lot you'll, you'll say oh I'm in severe pain I need to come in can you give me an appointment and they say yeah I've got a cancellation in about two hours what about then you know and they say oh no 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 uh, that's, that's, um, that's too early I need to, something in about two or three days time that's usually what they're comfortable with two or three days or next week or something so, anyway, so we're waiting for two of them to get in touch with us now for this appointment. Now, finally, this bloke does bring back and say you can get the time off work. And he's filled in the, the thing, so that's fine. So we get him booked in. And then last minute, last night, Wednesday, 5 o'clock or something, get another phone call from another bloke from France, believe it or not. And I didn't, he didn't pick it up because he had the 0033 prefix and... It came from a double glazing firm, believe it or not. And uh, this bloke said, no, you know, my daughter's in the UK at the moment and um, she's had a filling fallout, a temporary filling fallout or something. So can you uh, do anything for her? 
So I said, yeah, we, we can see her because we have a rule that we don't ever turn away children who have got problems, you know, acute problems like feelings falling out or pain or infection, or whatever. So uh, anyway, from what I can work out, it turns out that he's, I think he's separated from his wife or something. And his daughter's staying with his wife in the UK at the moment. But the why his wife's not rung us, I don't know. Apparently this bloke's organizing everything from France. So I said to him like, you know, we'll send you a link, fill in the details. So he does, fills in the details. And I book her in. And what I've done is I've had to, uh, instead of giving this bloke 45 minutes, I've given them both half an hour. Still more than adequate to deal with the problem. So um, anyway, what's the first thing he says? Look, um, have you got anything else? Right, other than 11 o'clock tomorrow morning, if that's inconvenient, can I, have you got another time for me? So like, I'm thinking, honestly, I mean, <laughs> here's a bloke, right, not registered with us at all, ringing from France, organising an appointment in another country, for a seven-year-old child, with an unspecified problem, probably temporary feeling falling out, God knows what that means. Offered an appointment, the next day, right, literally within 18 hours of ringing, and and told him that we would probably, there's probably no charge, because he was very worried about what it might cost, because his wife's gonna, his ex-wife probably is gonna have to pay for it. And, um, and then now wants to know whether he can have a choice of times. So, hello, ambulance. So I then uh, wrote back and said, no, I'm sorry, like a short notice, that's the, that's the only time I can offer you. Now I'm, uh, at this point, you know, I mean, it's tempting. At this point, you're starting to get a bit irritated. You know what I mean? You could bend over backwards for people and then they start taking the piss. And then we've got, with the first bloke and the last bloke, you know, they're on the border of that, aren't they? Starting to take the piss. So uh, I wrote back and said, no, with that on short notice, that's all we can do. So then the next email comes back is like, well, can I have Friday morning then? And the answer is the same. At short notice, you don't get to choose when you come in. You either come in when we say, or you don't come in, you find another dentist or you come in another, like a week later or something. Anyway, I said, look, I'm not gonna, I mean, this is about six o'clock in the evening. I wasn't even at work at this point. And I said to him, look, just ring reception, nine o'clock tomorrow. And then, and then basically she's gonna tell you, we've got no appointment. She'll tell you what I've just told you, but you'll, um, you'll appreciate it more coming from her because she'll be on the phone and I'm just on the email and I've been really helpful and she can be like really obstructionist as a <laughs> and you expect her to be do you know what I mean you're going to expect to hear that she's got no appointments because she's a receptionist I'm just being too bloody nice so anyway he, he then emailed back and said oh well no, 11 o'clock, I've, I've had a chat with my wife and 11 o'clock is okay. Now I understand, I mean, I appreciate they might have a problem. She might have to take a morning off of work, mightn't she, to bring her child in. But, um, you know, I think I'm, I'm, that's my problem, as I say, I can't, I don't say no enough. I should have said no straight away to the first bloke. And I should have, and I'm pleased that I did say no for the most part to the third bloke. But I've got a very busy day today, so I might give you an update on the way home, let you know how I've gone. All right, bye, bye. Well, good afternoon. How are you? I'll promise you a quick update on what's gonna, what happened about the 10.30 appointment. Basically, the young lad who uh, tried to get some time off work came in. He said he had pain on the top right. So we did an x-ray and sure enough, he's, uh, got some decay and a tooth on the top right so he needs a filling he told me that he's never had a filling done without being sedated because he runs around the room when you show him a needle 
So I said to him, well, we'll see how, we can see how we get on. But, you know, if we can't do it, we can't do it. But I think we probably can. Um, and then the little uh, the girl who came in from France, uh, she's a cute, cute little thing, but, you know, obviously, I think because her parents, her mother lives in the UK and her father lives in France, she's a bit too... Uh, how can I put it? Bit too used to getting what she wants. I think to uh, and, and I think what what basically got she's got a very very decayed adult tooth, lower right adult tooth, which I mean he's pushing it because your adult back teeth don't start coming through till you're six. So to have wrecked completely wrecked one by the time you're seven is you've done a really good job, haven't you? So. <laughs> the problem that you've got with patients with, with kids like that is, is twofold. First of all, that they don't think the problem is all that um, severe, you know. They think, oh, well, a little so-and-so needs a filling. Now, she didn't really want anything. She, she refused to um, uh, come in the door of the surgery until I came and... Uh, um, and said that she could see me, you know. And I think it's quite possible that she has had a bad experience in France. Um, although I can't see, well, you'll understand why. I think that's probably not so likely when I tell you the rest of it. Um, the, the thing is that um, she then came in and, and she was like, oh, well, uh, she won't open her mouth and all the usual, you know. So fortunately, she's got an older sister. So I got her older sister to be the uh, the dentist and, and do the checkup, and so they thought that was highly hilarious. So um, and when someone goes from being very distressed and upset to being highly hilarious, uh, then you know that really it's uh, it's not genuine distress. You know, it's just a complete act. Um, in the same way as this that woman the other day, uh, you know was saying that the pain was 10 out of 10 and then the next day it was worse than that um, whereas in fact um, you know when I said something that she find quite amusing so she found it hard to stifle a, stifle a laugh and that's when I knew straight away that all this oh Mr Watson I'm in so much pain but I'm not saying she wasn't in pain but what I'm saying is that a large amount of it probably 80% 90% of it was a really was a complete, you know, uh, front, you know, a charade. So you can tell where people are in severe pain if they come in with a two litre bottle of ice water and they're sipping from the water all the time, then they're the ones who are in severe pain. So what else? Yeah, so so um, she's in the chair and I said to her, uh, and then when, when uh, you know, I said, can I just have a look? She curled up into a ball. I mean, literally into a fetal ball in the chair. And so I just uh, said to her mother, look, you know, I said, you can't, you you can't even get me to look in her mouth to convince her to let me look in her mouth. I can't convince her to let me look in her mouth. I, I said, the problem is that she's not really emotionally uh, or, or you know, she's not emotionally or mentally mature enough, really, to know what is in her best interests. And kids are like that, you can't blame them. So, and her mother was a nightmare on top because her mother was saying, well, I'll, you know, I'll hold your hand, I'll come around this side. She's saying to her mother, come around this side. She said, <laughs> I said to her mother, just sit in the corner, sit in the corner, just sit in the corner. So, and her mum's like, oh, well, you know, if we, uh, if you let the dentist do what he wants to do, then I'll take you down the toy shop. If you let the dent, if you don't let the dentist do what he wants to do, I'll ring your dad and I'll get your dad, I'll get your dad on the phone. And I said, look, she's, you know, she doesn't have the emotional maturity to cope with this. And it, you can't really reward <clears throat> or punish a child for not being sufficiently developed uh, to, to understand, you know, that's why 
they have an age of criminal responsibility, don't they? Um, and an age of, uh, you know, sexual maturity or whatever. It's because children are not developed enough below a certain age, on average. Some are, most aren't, you know, to, to understand what's going on. So uh, I said to the mum, look, really, I'm not happy with you threatening me, You're threatening a child with me and saying, you know, that she's going to get a toy or not get a toy or, um, but she, you know, but I said that I'll put some uh, fluoride varnish on, on a tooth, which we eventually managed to do. And, um, her mum said, well, look, I was going to, uh, you know, I promised her I was going to take her down the seafront and buy her some candy floss if she was good. And at that point I thought, right, I said to Lou, out loud because that's the best way to do it. I just turned around and said, I think, I think we're getting closer to the cause of the problem here, you know. I said, all you can do really is um, uh, take, you know, is put her on a sugar-free diet. And the other, the other problem is that um, the parents don't like the fact when you explain to them that it's their, they, they've caused the problem, you know. Seven-year-olds don't get extremely decayed teeth. Uh, unless they're being fed basically a diet of sugar by the parents and obviously you know as I say shuttling between the two parents probably doesn't help but um, uh, you know uh, I'm gonna have to say to her that my advice is probably my best advice will be to get her sedated and just take all her first molars out and then wait wait until she's 12 years old you know, and the wait for the sevens and the eights to come through. But, but so, you know, the parents don't really know how serious it is at that point, how they've, you know, if they let it, left a child outside and it got frostbite and had to have its toes amputated, they would know that that was a serious thing. But they don't realize that feeding a child a very high sugar diet, which leads to it having its teeth amputated, is just as bad. Anyway, but then the other bloke didn't turn up, you know, Mr. Barra boy. He just didn't turn up, so. Anyway, that's enough for today. I'm going to go and have a well-earned sit-down and a bit of, uh, bit of dinner. All right, nice to talk to you. Bye.